on October 16th to mark this important milestone. This year has been a very exciting one as we move towards our new vision that um, Dr. Nagara was talking about of focusing on improving the access and success for first generation, low income and racialized minority students through campus leadership, improving culture and focusing on teaching and technology as lovers. In terms of um, the college student success work, uh, Tatiana Melgizo and I are finalizing the Promoting at Promise Student Success Project. This has been a six year mixed methods study exploring support for traditionally underserved students through a comprehensive college transition program. And it's one of the largest and most complex studies of this topic. And we've been able to garner dozens of insights ranging from the importance of major and career self-efficacy, customizing programs to the individual needs of students, and the way an ecology of validation is best suited to foster student success. Additionally, Adrian Huerta has been doing important work on men of color programs, examining the ways these support systems can increase the success of these populations, but also focusing on the ways that these programs can be better resourced by campuses to meet their goals. In terms of college access, Julie Pasalt has been assisting campuses to reconsider their use of standardized tests and using more holistic admissions processes with the national attention and changing policies around equitable admission, she's been quite busy in forming statewide and national discussions on this issue. And her work on graduate education reform was captured in a recent book, Equity and Science, that I highly recommend to everyone. Tatiana Milkiso's work has focused on math equity and she led a national summit that brought together leaders in math education, examining ways math policy can better support the access and success of all students. Many of you may know this is one of the major barriers to student success. She's also received several new grants to continue this work, including a Spencer Foundation grant to examine the implementation of a state mandate to end remediation in community colleges. And Zoe Corwin has been examining issues of college access, focusing on how skateboarding can develop critical skills related to college going, particularly for populations that often do not attend higher education. So we hope you're enjoying our revised newsletter that captures all this good work and the various scholars working within the center. Another part of our new vision was to increase our impact by developing more external partnerships so last year, we welcomed Laurel Espinoza from ACE, who's now at the Sloan Foundation, and Jennifer Coit with the National Center for the First Year Experience and Transitions. And one of the projects that emerged from this partnership is a study of equity-minded leadership, studying college presidents and their teams on campus that have been successful in advancing equitable student outcomes. I also want to call attention to our new blog, Higher Education Conversations in Black, highlighting the voices of Black scholars and leaders, and our new website page that's consolidating some of the key work that we're doing on racial equity. This summer, we committed to do even more to dismantle white supremacy, anti-Blackness, and all forms of oppression. And this talk is a part of that effort. And as we consider our 25th anniversary and reflect back, this is very much aligned with the focus of this year's lecture, which is about reflecting back and thinking about our institutional histories. And while sometimes we look back to celebrate accomplishments, other times we must look back to reconcile traumas and tragedies that have occurred. This is the same challenge that our country is currently engaged with in the aftermath of the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and too many others at the hands of police violence and brutality. This year's 42nd Polius Lecture, Advancing Racial Equity Through Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Campus, Center, Campus Centers asks us con to confront our institutional histories and to take responsibility for them. So many actions need to be acknowledged, reconsidered, and allow for healing. So to get us started, Julia Bagney is going to have a land acknowledgement, and she's a member of the Tribal Council and Cultural Consultant for the Tongva Tribe of the San Gabriel Valley, who are among the original habit inhabitants of this Los Angeles basin. Julia describes herself as a teacher, cultural ambassador, artist, speaker, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. So Julia, if you, if you will start us off.
Oh, you need to unmute yourself, Julia. I thought I did. No? Let's see. Now you are. You're all okay, set. Good. <laughs> Hello, I'm Julia Bogany. Uh, thank you for the introduction. We, the indigenous people, the traditional caretakers of this landscape, are the direct descendants of the first people who formed our lands, our worlds during creation time. We have always been here. Our ancestors prepared and became the landscape and worlds for the coming of humans with order, knowledge, and gifts embedded in the landscape. Our ancestors imbued the responsibility and obligation to our original instructions guided by protocol and etiquette to be part of, take care of, and ensure the welfare and extended family and community, defining its most inclusive expression to nature and to pass those teachings and responsibilities onto our children, grandchildren, and many generations to come and to all those that now live here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for starting this off so eloquently. I so much appreciate it. I want to next introduce our two wonderful speakers um, that will help us on this journey to consider racial justice and healing. Dr. Tia Brown McNair is the Vice President for the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Student Success and Executive Director for the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Campus Centers at the Association of American Colleges and Universities. She oversees AACMU's programs on equity, inclusive excellence, high impact, educational practices, and student success, all things that I know everyone here cares about. She's the lead author of a book that I absolutely love called Becoming a Student Ready College, A New Culture of Leadership for Student Success. And she earned her bachelor's degree in political science and English at James Madison University, holds an MA in English from Radford University, and a doctorate in higher education administration from George Washington University. And she's going to be kicking us off. But I'll also at this point in time introduce Dr. Punahe Leip, who's a native Hawaiian mother, daughter, wife, hula practitioner, and educator. Her research focuses on the central question, how can the University of Hawaii at Manoa, a predominantly non-Hawaiian university, transform into a Hawaiian place of learning? In 2017, she was hired as the inaugural Native Hawaiian Affairs Program Officer at the um, University of Hawaii Manoa's Chancellor's Office, where she implements the findings from her research to advance the goal of becoming a Native Hawaiian place of learning. I think that is so cool. She's also the director of University of Hawaii Manoa's Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Campus Centers that are a part of this larger project. She holds a BA in Hawaiian Studies, an MS in Counseling Psychology, and a PhD in Education Administration. And so exciting, she is an Obama leader uh, with the Obama Foundation's Asia Pacific Leaders Program. So with that, I will hand it over to our two very capable speakers to bring us through. Thanks so much. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you so much, and Pedro, for that welcome and introduction. And Julia, thank you so much for being with us as we acknowledge the land that we are on, as we recognize the history and the legacy of harm that has happened in this country. So we want to say thank you for all of you being here with us and for having this conversation about truth, racial healing, and transformation. I am looking forward to giving the context of the truth, racial healing, and transformation campus centers and then turning it over to my wonderful colleague, Puni Hay, to talk about the work that's happening at one of our campuses that's partnering with us on how to implement and lead this work on a daily basis. So thank you so much, Adriana, for just giving us the opportunity to share and to talk about the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Campus Center effort. And I also want to say thank you to um, our TRHT advisory board members, to Gail Christopher, who is the visionary and the architect of the TRHT effort when she was a senior vice president at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Thank you to our national evaluators, Jessica and Edwin Estevez, for their work to Lynn Pascrell, our president and the TRHT project staff at AACNU, but most importantly to all of the TRHT campus center leaders and teams and community partners that are working tirelessly on a daily basis to advance 
the work of truth, racial healing and transformation. This is a collaborative effort. It is a community-based effort. And it's the work that we are all so deeply committed to. So I just want to say thank you before we even begin this conversation to everyone who has been engaged in this effort. So I'm going to share my screen and do a couple of slides for you because I know that people learn and pay attention on Zoom in different ways. So I wanted to have some background for you. And I'm going to start here. Can you, hopefully everybody can see my screen. With just acknowledging that this is the strategic initiative AACNU, we have made a long-term commitment to work with institutions to prepare the next generation of leaders to advance justice and to build equitable communities. I want to recognize our initial funders for this effort, Newman's Own Foundation, W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and the Papa Jones Foundation. So why did we at AACNU decide to participate in a truth, racial healing, and transformation effort? We, we're already work deeply engaged, as many of you know, in diversity, equity, and inclusion work through our signature initiative, another signature initiative at AACNU called Making Excellence Inclusive. We believe strongly at AACNU that our mission is about quality and equity in undergraduate education and service in service to our democracy. And we want to make sure that not only are we looking at equity and learning, but we're also thinking about what it means to engage in a liberal education by being able to examine diverse perspectives and engage in deep dialogue. But as many of you know, and many of you have experienced, we are in a point in our country and even in our educational systems where the opportunity to have civil dialogue and to listen to others who have diverse opinions or different opinions than ours, that's actually becoming more and more difficult. We have turned into, in many instances, an us versus them society. And we believe that engaging in civil dialogue and being able to engage in conversations and truth telling and sharing our narratives is just as important as we talk about work about equity and high impact practices or equity in assessment or equity in STEM education. And so for those reasons, we believe that the work that we're doing in TRHT actually complements and supports our work that we are leading to make excellence inclusive for all students. And so I, I want you to go into this conversation knowing that we're not saying that this particular effort is the only strategy. It is one of many strategies, and I applaud the work at USC that Adriana is leading, the work that Sean Harper is leading at the USC Race and Equity Center, the work that Estella leads and continues to lead when she was at USC and as she continues, as she transitions into another role. I think that it's just as important for us to put those all together so that we can have the combination, as Gail talks about, the head and the heart to actually transform our structures and our policies and our systems in a way where we focus on our interconnected and our human value. So what do we do in TRHT? The goal of TRHT is to jettison, and Gail's a big Star Trek fan, so that's why she uses the terminology jettison, the false belief in a hierarchy of human value and replace that archaic notion with a reference and appreciation for the equal and interconnected nature of our human family. That is our ultimate goal for the TRHT effort. And for AAC and you, as a partner in the TRHT effort, our goal is to prepare the next generation of leaders to actually do this, to dismantle this false belief in a hierarchy of human value that actually divides us instead of uniting us into our interconnected nature of the human family. So we start off our effort and we start off our work with campuses by asking them to be visionaries. When we have our TRHT Institute, which you'll see a video from in just a few minutes, we ask the question, what will our communities look like, feel like, and be like when the belief in racial hierarchy no longer exists? We ask each campus to actually create a vision statement in addition to a mission statement and goals of what their community 
And when we mean community, we don't mean just the institution. We mean the larger community because all of the TRHT campus centers have community partners as well. And we ask them to think about that because so much of our system, and we know this as educators, we're, is built on a hierarchy of human value. We rank things constantly in our society and we give value to it based on those rankings and based on those preconceived notions and those perceptions. It's so deep, it's so deeply ingrained in us. And we want to challenge that and question that, that hierarchy of human value. And what do we need to do to make sure that it no longer exists? But before we do that, and this is where the heart and the head work where they unite. You have to, before you can transform, transform systems and structures, you have to do the people work first. And we have to remember that people implement policies and practices and structures. So working on and changing and challenging mindsets and sharing narratives and sharing truth and sharing experiences are, that's just as important to actually dealing with the more fundamental aspects of equity and learning or equity and student achievement or racial equity in our communities and in our systems and racialized practices. Those racialized practices are implemented and are implemented by people and designed by people. So we have 25 TRHD campus centers. And as you can see from the list, and I'm getting ready to share the second half of the list, all different types of institutions who have partnered with us to serve as host institutions for the TRHD campus centers. They work with us, they come to our institute, they've each developed an action plan based on the framework that I'm gonna share with you in just a few minutes. But they're individualized based on the narrative about race at their institution and within their community, based on key questions relation, related to racial equity and the institutional and the community priorities that they have identified as key leverage points for change. And we know that this is something that is not going to change overnight. But as we see the progress that is being made at these institutions, and we see the growth we see the mindset shifts. We see even the way that the narrative about race is shared and talked about. We know that we're making progress and that we are doing something that is helping to advance racial equity in this country. As you can see, additional members are partnering with us, additional institutions. They are working collaboratively together to actually lead the work on truth, racial healing, and transformation. So what are our goals and what are our, over, our overarching objectives that every campus center works on? They develop and implement a visionary plan, as I've already mentioned. And the very first thing that we want them to focus on is creating a positive narrative about race. Well, in order to do that, you have to understand what is the existing narrative on race and then to promote racial healing activities. Oftentimes, we minimize the trauma associated with racism. And Gail Christopher was very intentional in calling the, RX, the healing circles RX racial healing circles because she acknowledges that it is the trauma associated, the pain associated with dealing with racism and, and being the recipient of racialized actions that that has a mental and a physical impact on us and we as leaders of institution we hear our students saying this we hear our colleagues saying this but oftentimes it is dismissed and put to the side and not valued as a true experience and we don't want to do that so part of this work and foundational to all of the TRHT Campus Center is that all the educators that participate in this work go through what is called a preparation process on how to facilitate RX racial healing circles, how to lay the foundation for deep listening, for truth telling, for sharing of narratives before we get into the work about narrative change and looking at the hierarchy of human value in the economy and the laws and the separation of our institutional and our system-wide structures. 
And then we ask them to develop action plans that will erase the structural barriers to equal treatment. We ask them to identify key leverage points based on their research, based on the data that they collected, based on the experiences that were shared. And we ask them to set and develop an evaluation plan. And that's where our national evaluators come into play. We have what is called a stages of implement, implementation tool that has been developed and being beta tested by our existing TRHD campus centers so that they can actually measure and assess progress. Because we know that in our current system, if we don't do this part, people will not understand the impact of or the potential impact of what can happen with TRHD campus centers. And then we ask them, as I said, to identify and examine current realities of race relations, to look at the history and to acknowledge that history and be truthful about that history and to envision what their community would look like and feel like and to pinpoint key leverage, of change, leverage points for change and key stakeholders as they develop their action plan. This is a visual of the TRHT framework. My president, Lynn Pasquarella, and myself, we both participated on design teams in the early phases of the development of the TRHT framework to help shape this work. There are resources available on the Kellogg Foundation website, on our website, that will go deeper into these elements of the framework for TRHT. But we start with asking about narrative change. And all of our campuses have done this part, as I've said. They've looked at how, we're, how narrative about race is portrayed in the media, how it's portrayed through symbols on their campus, through curricula, through cultural institutions. Some of them have done extensive interviews with their community partners and with people on campus, with alumni, to actually figure out and identify areas of opportunity to advance racial equity. And as I've already mentioned, we've talked about racial healing and relationship building. And then they've designed and worked with faculty and educators to design assignments and educational experiences for students that help them understand the hierarchy of human value that has fueled division and that's so deeply embedded into our housing policies and practices. We all know into public health, we're dealing with COVID-19 right now, and we know the hierarchy of human value that is happening and the racial inequities that are occurring even dealing with COVID-19 and looking at immigration policies and education, criminal justice, mass incarceration, the economy, workforce, wealth distribution in this country. Our campuses are designing processes for students that when they want to go out into the community and do service learning, that they spend time utilizing the TRHT framework and exploring different aspects of the hierarchy of human value that's so deeply embedded within our systems. We focus on racial healing as part of TRHT because we need to recognize the need to acknowledge and tell the truth about past wrongs created by us as individuals and systemic racism and address those present consequences. We have to explore the truth and be willing to move, move from not only just truth telling, but to action so that we can have transformation. And in this, we consider the whole framework, including the use of RX racial healing circles as a process and a tool that first facilitates trust and to build authentic relationships that will help us build divides and bridge those, bridge those divides and build relationships and create real change across our perceived differences. That is what we want to do as part of this effort. And as I said, every campus has an individualized action plan based on this framework. They have an evaluation plan. They have metrics for success. And what we've learned from them is that in the collection of data, and in their analyses of the data, there are so many opportunities that can combine, as we talked about, the academic work for advancing equity, but also the hard work that is very needed to actually do the people work first. And what we've done is we have developed a publication, our first publication from our work on truth, racial healing transformation, that highlights what the first 10 campus centers have accomplished and the work that they are leading in their communities 
on TRHT. It also includes articles from our president, Lynn Pascarella, and also Gail Christopher, and our national evaluator. We want to make sure that the work that, that's happening, the change that is happening, is actually shared so that we can continue to scale and grow this effort because our minimum target at AACNU is to work with at least 150 institutions to host TRHT campus centers. And now what I would do is I'm gonna stop here as we transition to a video that you can actually see and hear from our TRHT campus center leaders before I transition it over to one of our amazing leaders, Puni He from University of Hawaii, Manoa. Thank you. Welcome to AACNU's first Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Institute. It's really nice for us to be deeply immersed in the work, to minimize our distractions, to really have immediate resources available to us when we have questions. You can't just move this work and deal with racial healing and racial injustices just through policy. You have to have that emotional component and that component that connects people. It's helped interrupt our normal way of going about conferences and institutes. Sunday morning when we engaged in the singing activities, it struck me on a personal level. My grandfather was a sharecropper, and these are some of the things I remember him humming. Musically, you could feel how those moments inspired a music tradition throughout the civil rights movement that I think is continuing today. Visiting the African American History Museum was critical in providing a framework for our action plan. Fanchon's performance on the opening night at One Drop of Love, I mean, we were just dazzled by her and her performance. The team time has forced us to be very introspective. We are experiencing uh, community hate groups coming to our campus. The other schools are. Yeah. We may be enjoying some privilege. We've come to an understanding of the healing circle as something that's a greater resource for our work than we appreciate it. It's our experience of it here that's convinced us of our ability to convince others. We're just really grateful that they thought that this work was integral enough and that a university can be part of leading the charge to move this conversation forward, especially in this current climate. The TRHT Center at Spelman College will provide the foundation for difficult dialogues about race and racial healing. We certainly hope that the outcome of our convenings will in fact build greater alliances across difference in the city of Atlanta and that those alliances will then spread beyond the metropolitan Atlanta community into larger community conversations throughout the U.S. We were previously doing listening circles on campus and our students were feeling like it was an us against them and being able to have these healing circles in a way that really was conversational. They were starting to feel the healing process and seeing a less us against them and more of an hour. Our TRHT Campus Center is going to be focused around breaking down not only racial hierarchies but also campus and community hierarchies. It contains four goals, strengthening student groups on campus, strengthening our service learning department on campus, and improving the experiences of young people that we bring on campus for our signature college night program. Our Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Campus Center is focusing on building off of the work that Millsaps has done through campus dialogue circles. We want people to be able to not only understand, but to feel what other people have felt in their lives. Our TRHT Center is all about empowering both our community and our college. Our projects are relatively small conversations, but strategically placed in spots where colleagues are developing program and need to be more in depth with each other as they develop them. Our work is focused on Hawaii and Native Hawaiians for sure, but it's also focused on all people who call Hawaii home because we all have to be partners in the work to take care of our place and take care of our people. And we need diverse questions that we would get at home if we didn't get them asked now. A lot of our work is really front and center, trying to think about different strategies to bring out truth, but the healing piece, I think that's what our university actually needs right now.
The TRHT Action Plan at Rutgers University Newark will include activities, events for residents and the community stakeholders to participate in authentic truth-telling narratives. It will also include the processes and activities that we are utilizing to increase the college graduation rate of Newark residents. We chose to help gel our group together and to pull more members of our internal campus team into the broader national conversation. We're going to be much more transparent about what has happened at the Citadel over our 175 years of existence. We would like for anyone in the community who may have old wounds to have a conversation with us, have a chance to talk and to promote deeper understanding and better appreciation of our institution and deepen our appreciation of that part of the community as well. What we're most excited about was that we actually created a space, an opportunity for different sectors to have conversations in a context where they're usually working side by side in their respective silos trying to address particular issues, but not talking with each other. Together, we will figure out how to do it. And we will serve as the nucleus of something that will expand exponentially. And I truly believe in my heart, one day, children will read about how America once believed in a hierarchy in the family. Thank you so much. I hope that gives you an idea of the work that we're doing. And I'm now going to turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Kunihe. Aloha mai kako, and ahoa maka maka, mai kalahi kia kalako, velina nui me kia aloha. Um, just to begin today, uh, I want to first start by sending my aloha, my family's aloha to all of you, wherever you are today in the world. Um, experiencing probably one, if not many challenges at this time. Um, it's because of those challenges that I share, um, show up in this work and that I am grateful that you have showed up today as well. Um, I want to also mahalo, I want to thank Dr. Adriana Kizar and the entire Polia Center staff for all the organizing. Um, I also want to thank Tia um, from AACNU for inviting our campus to share our story and represent just one example of all the TRHT Campus Center work happening today. Um, and then also uh, thank you Tia for, for setting um, the framework up so well that I can then kind of jump in and um, share kind of our, our campus specific um, story today, just a small part of our story. So what I'm gonna actually do is go ahead and share my screen at this time. And let's see here, and someone will tell me if you can't see it. Um, and what I'd like to do um, before I introduce myself and frame the few points I want to make today is I want to recognize that while I'm representing my campus, um, our story is one of actually so many hands, hearts, and minds coming together to create our TRHT movement. These people who you can see here are a group of amazing individuals um, who have been at the core of the work leading up to this particular presentation. So I really wanna thank them um, and recognize them as well. My name is Kaibi Puni Koika VQ, Puni Hey Life. Um, and I'd like to briefly introduce myself through some of my many genealogies, and that's a word you'll hear a lot from me today as an example of what I will be sharing in terms of our university's TRHT work. So biologically speaking, I'm the granddaughter and daughter of these people who trace their ancestral roots to places like Hawaii, India, China, and various places in Europe. Um, and obviously they shape how I show up in the world physically today. Um, but they've also shaped um, me through their intelligence, their imagination, and really their sheer will to persist. Uh, on the top corners are my grandmothers, who both had very little formal education, but managed to do amazing things for their children. And their children here are my parents, um, who are both first-generation college students and both earned uh, their PhDs. So they were amazing examples to us as well. Academically speaking, I'm the daughter of these people and so many others from places like South Kona, Mexico, and Aotearoa, New Zealand, who have pushed boundaries and borders in both literal and figurative ways, 
connecting ideas and communities and experiences and places in ways that birthed a new me, a me that they were intentional about shaping. Culturally speaking, I am the daughter of expert cultural practitioners, land struggles, and language revitalization movements. And geographically speaking, I am the daughter of Ka'ava, a small coastal town, Heia, a now suburban space with majestic mountains, and Manoa, a valley filled with rainbows and wisdom. Of course, there are no real boundaries between my biological and academic and cultural self. Each genealogy has shaped the other and all have helped to create me. My genealogy, my lineage naturally does not stop with those who have shaped me. Instead, it continues with those whom I shape. And of course, that work does not happen alone. We need partners for that work to birth new ideas, new experiences, and new children. So along with my partner, Dr. Daniel Light, whose ancestors survived the Trail of Tears and whose stories have also greatly shaped me, we chose to unite our genealogies and birth these two marvelous and sometimes mischievous children. So why is this important? For a few reasons, actually. First, where I come from, it's important to point out who is responsible for me and who I am accountable to. Second, the idea of making sense of who we are by identifying the many genealogies that shape us some we can choose and some we cannot choose. Some we continue and some we choose not to continue. That's really at the heart of our current TRHT work that I'll explain more about in a minute. And then third, also important to our TRHT work is that when we begin to share our stories, uh, you as the listener, me as the storyteller in this instance, we begin to connect. But in case my story and your story have not yet found some connection point through my introduction thus far, as my TRHT colleague, uh, Matthew Kamakoni Lynch reminds us, wherever we are in the world today, we each exist not only in cyberspace, but also on land, on this earth together. So if you can, please take a look out of a window, mine's right here to my right, and just take a breath and sense whatever connection you might have with that place. We invite you to thank our Mother Earth for all the ways she nourishes us, no matter who we are. And I'm just so grateful to Julia who pointed that out um, to begin our time together. For me, I'm in Hawaii and I'm currently learning and just so humbled by all the ways I continue to learn and discover how Mother Earth takes care of us here and the intelligent ways generations of people before me have built relationships with her to know how to love her back, as Julia again pointed out in the beginning. I'm also incredibly grateful to Mother Earth for her resilience. While many of us for many generations have not loved her back in appropriate ways. To be clear, no matter where we are on Earth today, we are tied to each other because we have this shared experience of needing Mother Earth and needing each other so that we can work together to take care of her. And for that connection to each of you today, I really am grateful. So all of that framing sets me up to talk about our UH Manoa story. The TRHC Campus Center, as Tia talked about, um, posed two really very powerful questions that changed my life and shapes our work every day. The first question is inviting us to create a positive, um, is to create a vision as Tia talks about, to actually envision our future or futures when racism is gone, when it is no more. And to us, that was a very powerful question. So actually I'd like to invite you right now to do what we did as a team. Go ahead, if you'd like, and close your eyes. And as you close your eyes, try to envision maybe the country, maybe your campus, perhaps your community, maybe even just your neighborhood without racism. Can you see it? Try harder if you can't yet. What looks different? What sounds different? What feels different? 
Just take one more moment. You can go ahead and open your eyes now. If any of you could somehow catch a glimpse of what that future without racism could look like, I invite you to jot it down immediately so you don't forget it and then hold on to it and work with others to cultivate it every day. That's the charge we as TRHT centers were given. But for our UHTRHT team, we actually couldn't immediately see that transformed future on our own. Not a single one of us, Native Hawaiian, Japanese, white, black, Filipino, European, we couldn't see it. But then our collective wisdom reminded us to look back in Hawaii's history just a little bit in order to look forward towards our future. So some of our truths. In the not so distant past, actually less than 200 years ago, Native Hawaiians had a cultural, political, religious, and organizational way of living in balance and harmony with our environments. The land, the water, the oceans, and all the natural elements were really sacred to the Native Hawaiian people. Thus, we treated them with the utmost care. This allowed for a society that worked in reciprocity with the environment and cared for the natural resources of Hawaii in a manner that allowed the environment to then reciprocate by providing all the nourishment and protection that we needed. During this time of abundance, Hawaii and Native Hawaiians produce or had the potential to produce 1 million metric tons of food annually, levels comparable to food consumption in Hawaii today. To be clear, Hawaii is one of the most isolated places on this earth, and Native Hawaiians relied solely on our resources within Hawaii to feed our people and did so while maintaining a healthy ecosystem. This history led our TRHT team to wonder what those values rooted in reciprocity with Mother Earth could look like if practiced by all people, irrespective of race, in Hawaii today. This process of looking back in our history in order to look forward to our transformed future helped us to articulate our vision. And in it, we say we envision a Hawaii in which each individual, family, and community can recognize and live into their collective and interdependent kuleana. Kuleana is dears, privileges, and responsibilities to care for one another and our aina, our aina being our land, sea, and skies. I want to pause here to invite you to wonder about what looking back to the layered genealogies of peoples and knowledge systems of your places could do to help you reimagine your transformed futures without racism. It's just something to think about. So back to our story in Hawaii. Fast forward to 2020, more than 90% of food in Hawaii is imported. We are experiencing sea level rise, catastrophic storms, landslides, rain bombs, fires, and other environmental catastrophes due to climate change. One of our islands on the northwest end of our archipelago recently vanished under the ocean forever. Do these events sound familiar? So the question becomes, why the drastic change in our ability to feed ourselves and maintain healthy ecosystems? Our TRHT Campus Center focuses on this very question. Our work posits that many of the causes are rooted in racism and settler colonialism, related structures both imported to Hawaii that have resulted in systematic efforts to eliminate and erase the indigenous knowledge of Hawaii. Knowledge that teaches all of us best practices for living in sustainable care with our island home. Knowledge that all of us who call Hawaii home today need if we want to maintain our livelihoods here, now and into the future. To be clear, we believe that the natural environment of Hawaii, ancestor to the Native Hawaiian people, are calling out to all of us who call Hawaii home to abandon structures and practices built from racism and other forms of oppression and collectively work towards aloha aina. Aloha aina being a way of being in deep love and reciprocity with each other and our land, sea, and skies. A way that we believe that will not only save our island, but will save all of us. As we articulated our vision, we realized that creating a positive narrative about race was important but was not going to be enough because the Native Hawaiian concept of kuleana does not originate with race. Rather, kuleana, or that dear role and responsibilities that we inherit and take on, emerge from knowing our genealogies, from knowing the interdependent 
genealogical connections to both ourselves, to humans, and our non-human worlds that really sustain life. So we realized that if we wanted to help folks move towards understanding and living into their kuleana, we needed additional tools. Race, even a really positive narrative about race, was not going to suffice. So we asked ourselves, if we want to create radically different futures, perhaps even futures that reflect Earth-rooted pasts, what radically different tools, lenses, frameworks, knowledge systems, and even languages might we need? I'd like to spend my last minute sharing a bit about that. To be clear, these are some of the main points we are making. First, we are using Indigenous and particularly Native Hawaiian lenses to ground our work. And we invite you to think about how the indigenous practices of your places can be helpful in jettisoning racism. And then also, Aina, as the land, sea, and skies, and all that is in between, is the central character in our story, is the central family member, and is at the heart of what we want to recommit to. And so, of course, we invite you to think about what that can mean for your work. So we had this theory based on what we knew about traditional Hawaiian culture, and we wondered if those Native Hawaiian guiding principles could translate and be applied in 21st century contexts, not only with Native Hawaiians, but with anyone who calls Hawaii home. And in order to do that work, in order to test our hypothesis, we do what educators sometimes do best. We created a curriculum. We created a curriculum based on the TRHT framework that Tia introduced earlier. And in particular, with a focus on narrative change and relationship building via Native Hawaiian principles. I want to be clear that there is a lot of other work going on on our campus that is addressing these other pillars of separation, law, and economy that Tia went over earlier. And we recognize the importance of and the gap in focusing on narrative change and relationship building together. So we piloted our curriculum with four cohorts our beloved guinea pigs, we might call them, uh, who have taught us so much over the past three years. At the heart of our curriculum is cultivating spaces and experiences that allow people to reconnect with themselves, with each other, and with Aina through Native Hawaiian frameworks. And through that process of reconnection, their particular roles and responsibilities, their kuleana, to care for one another and for aina really emerges. We always start with racial healing circles, as Tia explained, because that helps us begin the process of finding our common humanity as a foundation for the deeper work we have to do together. And then after various levels of reflection and programming, we invite folks into small groups to focus on a particular place that they have discovered that they all have some connection to and decide how they are going to take care of that place together. And it doesn't mean that they have any background in natural resource management, but instead that they are asking different kinds of questions grounded in Native Hawaiian frameworks because of their newfound relationships with themselves, with each other and that place. Some of the questions include, who are the elders who have the most intimate knowledge of those places? And how can they help teach us? And of course, that's part of how we look at diversity and inclusion, whose knowledge gets included in the plan. We ask, how do we take care of those elders so that they can teach and guide us? Who are the people whom we need to teach, whom we need to bring along so this work never ends? And of course, that's our sustainability plan. That's the next generation Tia is talking about. And what genealogies and lineages do I bring that can help with this work, no matter who I am? What are my assets? And then how do, how do I accept care and love so that I can be a healthy contributor to this work as well? And then they actually come up with responses and make a plan. So far, this is how we begin to plant our TRHT seeds in our community. And so the question we pose to all of you is, can you imagine if every day we went around asking those questions? How that would change us, how that would change the way we raise our children, and how that would change the way we create space in higher education?
For our team, as we think about Aloha'ina, this deep familial responsibility to each other and the lands and skies, to the environments that feed and nourish us every day. And as we're thinking about our transformed futures without racism, we see an all hands on deck situation. Of course, in recent months, as has been touched upon already, we have been reminded of more than one reason why all hands on deck are necessary for the present and for the future. And our team argues that one of those reasons has to be that Hawaii is gonna be underwater soon, that island earth is gonna be underwater soon if we don't make a change. In closing, our TRHT work is about using indigenous wisdom for all to come together, to honor one another's assets and genealogies of intelligence, love, and care and to bring to the surface the genealogies and lessons of when love and care have not been present so that we can learn from our mistakes and never ever repeat them. That's the story we bring to you today. We hope that this has planted a sea of wonder and possibility. And if nothing else, perhaps a realization that every university in America is on indigenous land. And thus the places in which many of us work and go to school every day have so much wisdom and potential right under our feet on all around us to teach us how to care for one another and island earth. Isn't that such an amazing gift? That's all I have for now. Thank you. Over to you, Adriana. Thank you so much. I really appreciate both of our wonderful speakers introducing us to the framework talking about the experience at the University of Hawaii Manoa and your and so much also from uh, learning about your your personal stories as well. I have to say um, you know so many words are coming to me now of heart and healing and storytelling and the power of narrative and connecting to place and the power of re-envisioning you know that so so underlies this work how, how do we get to a future that we don't live in without that kind of visioning work was so powerful and i loved this quote that i think we should all paste some somewhere on our computers is before you can transform systems and structures you want you must uh, do people work first um, that is such a powerful sort of prevalent um, aspect throughout these two talks we are now opening it up for um, questions, and there are several in the Q&A that I will tee up for um, our two speakers, and you can decide if one of you wants to take it first um, or hand it off to the other. And we're so excited for your questions, so please keep them coming in. Um, and and uh, thank you so much for everything you've already shared. It was so wonderful. Um, so our first question, um, is how might we envision an economic, equ an economically equitable uh, humanity as we jettison racism and reconnect and strengthen connection to Mother Earth? How do we undo economic have or have nots, despair and mistrust? This divide becomes more and more stark. Everybody wants to start. I can just start. Um, I'll probably have a very different answer. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll first say that um, I don't actually have a very good relationship with um, money in the economy. Um, it's not something I think that is ancestrally rooted in me, um, but I know some of my colleagues would have other responses. I think uh, what I would like to do is point to um, a, a really interesting uh, movement that's going on at home um, called, called the Aina Aloha Economic um, Futures. And I'm going to write it in here. I'll, I'll look for the. Well, I'm not good at typing and um, talking at the same time, but I'm going to try and do that if everybody can see that and you can Google it. Um, but there's some really interesting work going on here in Hawaii that is actually thinking about how we transform the way we, we, we approach um, the economy rooted again in these in these values that I just spoke about um, that can really help not only take care of one another differently. And I don't know what it's been like on the continent, but in Hawaii during COVID, watching people emerge out of their communities and and use the various types of capital that they have oftentimes not dollars um to re-engage as a community and actually feed one another in in real and in kind of um different you know 
spiritual, emotional ways right now has been really amazing and I think really reflects a different value set that we have that we're yearning to, to put into place that often gets um, sidelined because of, of the, the, the mainstream ways of engaging in the economy today. So um, thank you, who, I, that's probably Jonathan who put that up. Um, so I wanna just highlight their work as an example um, and, and think about how value systems like we talked about earlier that are, are in, our, in us, in humans that we produce um, and in our behaviors really shape the way that we engage in our economies today. But that doesn't have to be, right? We can actually, um, if we look back to different value sets, um, that can probably that can guide. We have seen it guide. We see it guided in microwaves every day. Um, you know, that can help us create our transformed futures. So I'll stop there, and maybe let Tia add if she would like to. Thank you. I, I mean, I completely agree with you, and I think that that whole concept, and Puni, hey, when you were talking about the value system, we have to be willing to share the truth about the. Um, it's the racism within our own economic policies and structures. And I think that it has been pointed out, it has been identified through so many different um, ways that, that scholars who focus on racial equity have shared with us. And we have to be willing and not, and, I'm t and when I mean we, I mean we collectively, those that are in those, in the positions that are actually stopping that progress from happening. We have to be truthful about the impact of our own decisions and our own structures and the way that we have been making decisions about wealth distribution and education, you know, in this country, if we are really going to transform. But, and, but, but if we're in the process of this, let's be honest. There are people that want that system to continue, that have benefited from that system and do not want it to be dismantled in a way that is equitable for all of us. And that piece is something that we haven't been able to, to cross over from and we haven't been able to deal with in a way that is going to actually lead change. And what we need is this movement that's happening right now is more and more people coming together saying it's unacceptable and we have to do something about it. That's why Congresswoman Lee, Barbara Lee, I'm so just inspired by her work and thanking her for focusing on the TRHT commission and trying to get legislation to, um, with her colleagues and saying that we have to do, we have to do the TRHT work. We have to have this at a national and with policymakers and, and everyone involved so that this is not something that is just happening in higher education or happening in our TRHT communities, but at a national level, because that's where change is going to happen. So I just wanna say thank you to Congresswoman Barbara Lee from California, who is leading this work and leading this initiative in Congress. And for those other partners in TRHT that are trying to, that are saying our economic policies, our segregationist policies, our separation policies, our laws have to change if we are really going to dismantle the belief in a hierarchy of human value and dismantle racism in this country. Thank you so much for your responses to our first question. Puna, there's a question that's directed more towards you. It's, it's asking about, can you speak to the relationship between the work that you were doing, the TRHT work, and the administration of the university? Sort of what, what, what did that look like? Um, I could probably interpret that question in a lot of ways. So um, whoever wrote, they can, you can further clarify if you'd like to. Um, I can see a couple of things. One of my slides showed a cohort of executive leadership um, actually engaging in our TRHT process. Uh, we did that during the winter. So between kind of November and January of this year. Um, and so we are, we believe that obviously, you know, the role that um, our leadership plays in, in helping to jettison racism, to creating policies, and I think that's, you know, you know, they're in charge of policies and budgets, um, which are very real parts of how we get this work done. Um, so we are working collaborat collaboratively with them to, to, to move this work forward. Um, I'm not sure if that's the, the, question, the answer to the question that this person is asking. Um, you know, I will say that I'm really proud of our of our new provost who has just um, commissioned um, uh, a, a group of folks to come together to work on race, a race and bias commission. And so I think, um, you know, 
there's always more work to do in, uh, in executive administration there and there. And right now I can't imagine being a chancellor or provost or a president in this COVID situation. I know in Hawaii, it's, um, it's really difficult, especially with our economic situation, as we talked about. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there, there's, there's so much growth that we all need. And I think the idea of all hands on deck, what do I bring to the table, um, is something that really can help empower administration anywhere. And they don't need to have all the answers. They don't need to be race experts, but being willing to come to the table is really important. And so we're working with our administration closely to make sure that that happens across our campus. I'm really proud how many deans, um, vice chancellors, and, our pro and both our provost and president um, participated in that initial, initial um, cohort. So uh, lots more work to do, but, but we're getting there. And Mark, he fine-tuned his question a little bit as saying um, if they were supportive, and I think you've alluded to this, beyond funding um, to impact like the ways they might be kind of uh, hands-on in impacting policies and budget formation, just not resource allocation, but like rethinking budgets. And, um, and I, you know, it's interesting because like just in my work on transformation, I've sometimes talked to senior leaders saying that they don't always know exactly what is the best way they can be supportive of work. So I think you were alluding some ways and I didn't know if you wanted to elaborate yeah. anymore. Well, I just wanna say that there's a lot of work that as Tia mentioned earlier, that has been going on for a long time and that TRHT is, is, a, is another, you know, integral layer to this work. And so for example, at UH Manoa, um, there are Native Hawaiian advisory bodies that, and at, at our campus that, that um, advise our, our leadership. And so that work has been happening since 2001, really trying to engage um, leadership in conversations about social justice, you know, for Hawaiians and in Hawaii, so on and so forth. And so that that work to kind of help folks, help our leadership reimagine budget allocation and et cetera, et cetera, have been going on for quite a while. Um, and there's always more work to do, right? Like th this, this is this is not done. Um, and and I want to recognize that as well. So um, yeah, it's it's. It's constant, and it's it's about I think for me um, and and via TH, TRHT is we have to figure out better ways to be in relationship with one another um, every day. And you know, the, I think the higher up you go in administration, the more busy you get, the less time you have, the meetings get shorter, right? How do we make make sure we, we are rehumanizing those spaces and and moments? Um, for leadership, because I think they're in such tough positions, and how do we make sure that they are tended to, as, as, as the questions alluded to earlier, and vice versa, so that we can continue that relationship building and healing that's necessary, even in a half an hour meeting. And can I just say that I, after visiting and doing site visits to the TRHE campus centers, that what Punihei is describing in that partnership with administration and those that are leading the TRHT efforts, that exists on many of our campuses and many of our institutional leaders are knowledgeable, engaged and with the work and can think and talk and think about ways to actually be more strategic about how TRHT is implemented with their larger DEI works. I'm getting ready to be on a panel with um, Dr. Rhodes from, AAC, from ACC and then have a conversation about that. So I, I really do think that that work and from the and with the president from Hamlin University. So they are engaged, they are familiar, and that's exactly what we want to happen. Thank you so much. I'm going to read our next question, which is about what is needed within higher education space to shift indigenous knowledges and ways of being from a, a subject of study to a source of enlightenment and really transforming our institutions more. So kind of taking out of the margins into the center, um, which will not be pushed aside by institutions and, and get it on equal footing. Um, at the heart of the discussion and conflict is a devaluing of indigenous knowledges and um, values for greater good of humanity. So if, if you wanna to touch on that question as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I touched on it a little bit earlier. Again, I also want to um, situate our m m our current work in, in this larger history of work that's been happening, at least at my university. Um, in 1986, the first report was written that gives recommendations about how to make UH Manoa um, more responsive, not only to Native Hawaiian communities, but more reflective of Indigenous Hawaii in general. And over time, you know, that 30 plus years um, work to help recenter 
Indigenous Hawaii as something useful, not only for Hawaiians, but for all people who call Hawaii home has, has been going on. Um, and so that work doesn't happen overnight, obviously. <laughs> Racism is deep and that work takes time. And, you know, there have, like I said, you know, especially through settler colonialism, there have been systematic ways that, you know, that knowledge system has been removed. And that's, that's not just in Hawaii, right? That's everywhere. And so I think our first moment is to really be able to sit with that truth. And it's not a comfortable truth. It's not comfortable for anybody. Uh, I don't care what color your skin is, right? And it's shaped everyone, right? So it's not only that it's shaped, and to be able to realize that, and that's why we think the TRHD framework is so important, because we have to be able to build a relationship with that truth and with each other in that truth. That doesn't go away. Um, so, you know, every, every space has their own process, but, um, you know, when we're talking about the layers of, of truths that need to be told and understood, um, I think if we all ask ourselves, in addition to all the other communities, and they're all important, right? How can we remember to re-include questions and exploration about our indigenous truths, our indigenous spaces? When we start that that kind of like ground level, right? That 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 first layer of story and people in a place. Um, that is setting up a baseline um, so that we don't continue erasure, right? Because if we only start with, with one part of history and we, we miss all this other part down, you know, before it, um, then we're really participating in erasure all over again. Uh, so it's, you know, how we help each other turn our light bulbs on and then how we help each other, again, in this people work, um, figure out what that means for us. So it's a process for sure. Um, and everyone has their own kind of method to doing that. Do you want to add anything on? I don't think I need to add anything else to what <laughs> Minnie just said. I think she covered it. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we have uh, another question that I wanted to pose for you, and it's to both of you. It asks if you can speak a little bit more about Kuliana, uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. How are we genealogically connected through the TRHT work? How are we all connected through a Native Hawaiian or Indigenous lens? I mean, I can start, um, I think I'm not, I, I could take that question a couple of different ways. So I think back to the, the point I made at the beginning about if, if there's no other way we're connected, which I don't believe, we're all on this shared earth together. And that alone, you know, no matter what story, no matter what, what version of, of your origin story you know or believe, um, that unites us and in very real scientific ways, if we don't figure out, you know, some things pretty quickly, um, we're all, we, I mean, we're all already connected by the impacts of climate change. Um, but I think, you know, and then there's the story of the human family that Dr. Christopher, you know, always leans into. Um, so we all have shared connected truths. Like there are things, if you, if you use genealogy as a framework to think about the way many things are connected and coming together to create things in this world, you know, you can look at it scientifically, you can look at it other, you know, in other ways, we're connected. And, and that's, I think, the point of the arts racial healing circles, as Tia talked about earlier, is that we need to re-remember re that connection and that common humanity. Um, and again, from a Hawaiian point of view, once we know we're connected, we're seeking ways to know how to take care of one another. That's the kind of the whole, that's what aloha is all about. So aloha is like two words, alo and ha. So the idea of alo is that we get to know each other so well face to face that, you know, that I have a relationship with you, you have a relationship with me, that we then, because of that relationship, know how to care for one another and receive care to maintain and increase our well being. That is critical in a Hawaiian perspective. That is what kuleana is about, is like, me taking care of you, you taking care of me. Um, so that's that's how I would answer it. But you know, Tia, go for it, Tia. No, I, I, every time I'm engaged and have the opportunity to listen and work with you, Punihei, I learn more about how we are connected in so many different ways from my cultural background and from my experiences and what I've learned growing up in the church and in Southwest Virginia and the connection to family and to the value of land and to the, the, just the connection to our shared responsibility to engage with one another in a way that is not divisive and that is not 
how we are seeing the world right now, that unfortunately that our children are seeing the world right now. And I think that when this happens in this dialogue and this opportunity to engage with one another happens is a perfect example of that. And when, th when stories and narratives that have been marginalized because of racism are actually in the center and, in, and there, not because someone gave us access to it, but because that's where it should be, that's, this is what our work should be. So thank you, always. So I wanted to ask you, I, I know that when I've been engaged in projects where people are trying to envision something they've never done before, right? So uh, a, a society, a campus without racism, some of the things that you talked about to, to move us to a different place. I saw in your slot in some of the slides and the videos, it, it looked like interesting activities going on, right? So they had those looked like kind of like almost visioning boards. But I, I wondered if you might talk about a few of those tangible ways that you got people to do that really important but sometimes hard work to get them if you know it, thinking in a different way than we often think and the kind of activities they might have to be involved in so i just want to be completely honest with you some people struggled with that we had those and everybody knows this we've had we had those campuses and educators that embraced it like punehe and the team from university of hawaii manoa and they were able to take that to so many different levels. And then there were others that said, what do you mean? Oppression's real. It's never going to go away. And, and I can't imagine what our society would look like and feel like and be like when there's no longer a hierarchy of human value. The circles and what we have seen, and Punia, you can probably attest to this, is when we start our institute by engaging in RX racial healing circles, the energy and the community that comes out of that, whether you were in a circle with someone or not in a circle or they were in a different circle, it puts us in this headspace where that possibility and that visioning can happen. And then the way that it's designed by hearing our leaders from our first cohort and our TRHT mentors engaging in that conversation and talking about the work that's how we were able to move it forward. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. Many of the people from the first cohort, and Punia, you know this, our first institute, they pushed back a lot. Tia, we can't imagine this. What are you talking about? This doesn't make sense. Because we were, the TRHT effort wasn't initially designed to be in higher education. Our partners from the Kellogg Foundation reached out to AACU and said, what, what is the possibility? that we can actually, how can we work with higher education? Because we see higher education being such a critical part to um, addressing racism. And, and we know in preparing the next generation. So I can tell you that the difference between the first institute and the institute that we had in Villanova, we had our mentors saying, you know what? We, it's, it's coming together, we're seeing it now. And as we go through this process together, more and more opportunities, whether that's through dialogues, whether that's through the collection of narratives, whether that's through the more uh, institutes that are happening at the actual campus centers and they're able, able to make those connections and translate the framework into a practice and into structures that actually work for them, we're seeing these, the, the possible change happen. I would just add, I mean, I think, as Tia said, being able to envision something you've never experienced is really hard, right? It's really, really hard. I mean, I, I had this conversation in a friend's kitchen one day with happened to be two African American men, and I was actually on my way to Pennsylvania to, to Villanova, and they're like, "Why are you Why are you there?" And I said, "Oh, we're doing some race work," and you know, so I explained to them what it was about, and I said, "Yeah, so you know, our, our job is to envision a future without racism," and they just looked at me and said imagine that you know they i said I, they said i can't i can't imagine can you can you and they went back and forth and they just really couldn't and how, how could they if there's nothing in their ancestral dna that or or something very 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 long ago 
that they cannot reconnect to that reminds them of a, a time. And that's why I say in our, in our, you know, our presentation about UH Mano is that we really needed to look back and we're so lucky and I recognize that that's not everyone's reality to be able to look back um, in the same way that we were able to, to really um, explore a time not too long ago when, when racism didn't exist here and to draw from that. Um, and that's tricky work, but that's why I encourage it because we're gonna need different kinds of tools and memories that we're gonna need to dig out and bring and bring forth in order um, to, to envision. And as Tia said, yeah, the campuses, often their first, um, their first iteration of a vision is not a vision. I'm like, no, no, those are like, those are your steps. That's like your mission, but what does it look like? And they're just like, I don't understand the question. It takes time. And so I think the, and then by having experiences that are different that we've never had before through healing circles and other things, you begin to see a little bit of light and hope. And hope is really important, I wanna say, um, as well as courage, right? So you can have hope, but then you have to like act upon it. And um, that's, that's been one of the lessons for us. Well, I wanna thank you both. We are at time for your very hopeful um, ending. And we, um, I want to have, I'm sure with everybody, we're getting messages in the chat that are saying thank you and this is terrific and so, um, hopefully you'll get a chance to look at those as, as uh, everybody is uh, slowly leaving. But before you do, we have a video to share with you um, that connects this work to today's time period where we are experiencing very high levels of division, white supremacy, um, a lot of racial inequities. And so this video helps to highlight how important this work is right now but we just want to warn you that it's a little bit intense some of the images that you'll see but we hope that you'll stay on and that this can help underscore for you how important deeply important this work is thank you so much puna hey thank you so much tia for this wonderful wonderful pre presentation um I'm, i i just am you know i have so many feelings um and and you've stirred so much up for all of us so so thank you for doing that and i think jonathan if you can tee us up on the video we'll we'll um say thanks and and leave you with this party message We begin with the breaking news from Minneapolis. Violent protests raged for a second straight night following the death of George Floyd after being arrested by a Minneapolis police officer. The killing of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police officers broadcast for eight minutes and 46 seconds in a continuous loop over television and social media took place amidst the backdrop of a nation reeling from the worst global pandemic in over a century and from an economic recession leading to the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. As people took to the streets in Black Lives Matter protests across the country, it became clear that Mr. Floyd's death had sparked a moment of racial reckoning in America. AACNU turned to civil rights leader Freedom Rider and AACNU Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Advisory Board member, Dr. Bernard Lafayette, for his insights on this pivotal moment in our nation's history, what we can learn from the past, and how we can move forward in addressing anti-Black racism. From time to time, you have these incidents that bring an entire period of experiences together, and we can see the consequences of what has happened uh, continuously, and sometimes it's uh, episodic. Many incidents can happen, but they don't get the kind of attention. It's something about what happens to a person's face that makes the difference. In the case of George Floyd, we had not only his face, but we could hear his voice. So the sound of his voice asking for his life made the difference. We are revisiting now in very in-depth way, the kind of uh, racism 
and the uh, effects of racism, but it says uh, something to us now that we've never heard before, and that is a nation crying out, and people are saying, no, we reject this. At the end of a week that marked an unprecedented boycott by players in the NBA, WNBA, Major League Baseball, and Major League Soccer, in response to the shooting of Jacob Blake, a black man shot in the back seven times by police in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Thousands gathered at the base of the Lincoln Memorial, where Dr. King delivered his iconic I Have a Dream speech in renewed calls for racial justice. The Get Your Knee Off Our Backs commitment march, named in honor of George Floyd, took place on the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Justice and on the 65th anniversary of the lynching of 14-year-old Emmett Till, an event which catalyzed the civil rights movement. In his book on the life and legacy of Congressman John Lewis, author John Meacham argues that Lewis was, quote, as important to the founding of a modern and multi-ethnic 20th and 21st century America as Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and Samuel Adams were to the creation of the Republic in the 18th century. The same can be said of Dr. Lafayette, Lewis's college roommate and fellow acolyte of Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolent social change. For Doc, the way forward, now as then, centers on getting people to exercise the right to vote. Because there have been very diminishing subject matter for young people related to our governance. And that's one of the most important aspects of our lives. And the earlier our young people understand how the government works, or how it doesn't work, the better. At the age of 22, Dr. Lafayette assumed the directorship of the Alabama Voter Registration Project in Selma, a city that had previously been removed from the organization's list due to the dangers of operating there. By 1965, Selma had become a nationally recognized center in the fight for racial equality and social change. You can't deal with all the problems at once. So in our movement, one of our strategies was to pick a single issue or problem that affect, you know, the masses of people and then work on a strategy to make that change. And right now, I would urge all the groups to right now focus on voter registration and voter participation. This is an opportunity that we might not have in our immediate future. If we don't take advantage of it now, we're going to be dealing with more problems, okay, for the next election period. The reason why police brutality exists is because those who are in authority and in position to end police brutality, okay, are not in office. So I urge no matter what problem you're solving, uh, you solve problem you're working on, that participation and voting, right now, that's the most urgent thing. Higher education must play a leadership role in advancing racial and social justice. For more information about AAC News Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Initiative, and commitment to civic engagement, go to www.aacu.org.